today we're talking about the forge that's not the right button comprised just of a few things first of all and most importantly charcoal this is what's burned local hardware store buy the good stuff if you can break it with your fingers it's no good it needs to it needs to be a crystalline structure it needs to have a certain ting sound to it good charcoal different sizes i could do an entire video just on charcoal charcoal inside if you can have something covered over that you can make dark and keep dry best case scenario i started outdoors many of us start outdoors if you are outdoors uh welding goggles something that fit tight give you the best chance of understanding the color of your steel as you're working on the anvil i can't have a, a fire on the ground it'll just wick away all that heat now in that case i can build the ground up put lots of rocks put in my drainage build it up again and then put my forge down that will give me a nice dry area that I can get really strong welding temperatures. But that's like best case scenario, something I'd like for my next forge. Right now it is a tree that came down and some two by sixes that were left over from some other project. This is a go-to technique for me where I take whatever length of lumber and then I cut 45 degree wedge out of its side. And I keep that wedge, which means now I can take that leg and I can directly fasten it to really any 90 degree angle. And by keeping the little wedge, I can cut that down and that can go right underneath that main structure to give it extra support. It's just a fun, very quick way to make something look like you. You wanted it to look nice. Now with two two by sixes, I'll cut to whatever sizes they needed to be and a bunch of three inch screws gives me that base plate to mount the cinder blocks to. A lot of time is spent looking and tending to the fire. So the size of the fire is really important or the height of this aspect. I didn't know what I wanted mine to be. So I'm totally cheating and I'm gonna mount mine in the ground. One, I get more structure with that. So that's a good part of my excuse. Two, it means all those legs don't have to be like perfectly even because I can just level up each space. Three, I can play with different heights to see which and where I liked it, which took a lot longer than I thought. With an anvil, it's super simple. You just kind of bend your knees slightly, let your arm hang relaxed, and make a fist. Where your knuckles are is roughly where the height of your anvil face should be. I didn't really have any of those measurements for this, so this method worked really well, and I get to save it. In the future, I can just pop that out and have my table back. Yeah, that worked out well. It's flammable, true. So I've got these, uh, I don't know what they are. I think they're called paving stones. They're 24 inches by 24 inches. They're roughly two inches thick. And they've got some rebar in them. Found them in the ground. they're non-flammable so that just covers the main wooden structure so then I can use my fire brick this I feel is the most important aspect of any forge build like even more than the grill which seems stupid but it's like you've got to pay honor to the fuel that you're using that this charcoal it takes a long time to get it prepared and you get a lot of energy from it but if you don't contain that energy you are just losing it. So within this placement, I don't know if you know, uh, like a traditional Japanese dojo has tatame on the floor. Tatame are always the same size and they have patterns that they can lay out that will always fit a shape. Fire bricks are exactly that, but nothing like that. But you can lay out the pattern, same pattern you're with tatame, and you're always gonna fit that geometric shape, a rectangular square. So you've got that, you want to build something. If you don't have a welder, rent a welder because you probably won't use it often if you're building a forge or you might if you like welding. So this is the simplest steel you can get. I got this from my local hardware store. It's eighth of an inch by half of an inch by however much you want to buy. 
I've cut little spacers. So I had a grill piece and then a spacer and a grill piece and a spacer and so on and so forth. And I get to build this whole size grill. And then when the first side is tacked, I just flip it over and weld the other side up. It doesn't really get any simpler than that. Next step is to square it up because it needs to fit in the size of a brick. So let's actually spend some time like I care, which I do, don't get me wrong, but uh, knives are so much more fun to make. So here's the aluminum shroud, which I'm always got a hammer just to make sure it fits properly. Self-tapping screws are amazing for aluminum, though I want to make this out of steel next time. And I'm using a high temperature silicone so I don't lose power when the, the engines are turned on. Back with the hammer again. And then more self-tapping screws, more silicone. I make fun of myself, but honestly, this is just a simple design that went together really quickly, and now I get to see how it works, and I'm quite happy with it. This grill. The outside is aluminum on these. Yeah, you steel. I should have used steel. I was testing them, and even in testing them, I probably should have used steel, but oh well. And now back to these for a moment. They're extension corded. So if you can see back here, there's a receptacle that it's plugged into and behind my shoulder here, is that in frame? Almost. No, I like that frame. There's the button and then there's a switch. So it plugs into that receptacle and with that dimmer switch, I can control if I'm just heating up steel like I'm doing now, just slowly annealing it. So we're just using the, the single at a really low temperature because again, there's so much insulation and thermal mass within those rocks. I don't need to blast it with a lot of energy. But if I do want to blast it with a lot of energy, I use this one. I'm not as much of a fan as, why do I have to choose the word just to use the word again? Of the fan, the propeller blade. I want something like the other but it's what I have and it, it moves the right amount of air. That's 50 CFM and this is 150 CFM. That's significant. And I need that significant because I'm lazy and I made this, which is a terrible design, but it works. You know, I'm trying to talk here. Would, would you like me to let you out? Excuse me. Oh, Mr. Honeybee. Now I say it's a terrible design because it should flow. There's just so much area to find turbulence, but it did prove, it did prove it worked really well. I was able to heat treat a blade that was just a little shy of that amount really easily. It's all about getting that even temperature and having that even fire, having good charcoal. And then just to make it, because you think a, uh, a traditional, they have the bellow system. You're moving a tremendous amount of air at one point into the, the fire pot. It's a great way to control the heat because you're creating a lot of the heat. I don't have near the power here. So by able to extend the fire, I can extend the heat. And because this has got its own power source and those two, now I can increase the length of the swords that I'm heat treating. So if you have one of these vents, you need to have, you, you need to have, you need to clean it out every time or have a clean out that comes down. Some have clean outs where it actually fully drops out of the forge, but then I feel you don't get the same pressure of a pressurized system. I think because I'm using less pressure, I don't know, I don't like that. I'd rather clean it out every single time and make sure I've got that proper draw. I like this for forge welding. I can control really large pieces of steel quite easily with this, this type of grill. So grills, and now like almost lastly, your hood. You need something that's going to take all that heat away and out of your workspace. It makes a lot of sparks and the sparks are awfully pretty. That's it. Uh, once you've got your tools, you're sculpting with steel. It's Play-Doh or clay with hammers. 
But speaking of tools, you're going to need a bunch of hammers. You're going to need an anvil that works for the size of space that you have and that you can find. You don't need a post vise, but they're great. Troughs, you're going to need multiple things to hold liquids and oils. Cutoffs and center punches, grinders and sanders to clean things up, and like most important, your PPE. Keep yourself safe. When you're burning charcoal, charcoal is releasing carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is not good for us. It's a very heavy gas, but if we breathe it in, it slowly poisonous us poisons us and it compounds, which means we never get rid of it. We just, whatever we take in, we keep forever. So you need to have vents or holes at the bottom of your shop to allow that gas to escape. It's heavy, so where I'm sitting now, I can't breathe it in. But if this place were to be sealed up, that'd be a real issue. And I don't, I don't wanna deal with that and you shouldn't have to deal with that. So make sure there's lots of vents and lots of abilities to breathe. Yeah, that is the most important. That is definitely the most important rule. And then one just to add to it while I slowly put these things away is that the ability is really handy that you are going to learn where and when to strike your steel through its color. And observing the color early, oh, it's just, it's tremendous. And depending what you're doing, it just, this allows so much more visibility. And in a lot of my videos, I bring in a lot more light to, to share what's going on. But when I'm on my own, just happening to be forging for myself, I want this place as dark as possible. That it gives me the best sense of what's going on. And it's funny in the sense that when you are not actually working, you're, you're really blind as a bat. You don't know what's going on other than what's in the fire. You have to stumble around to find your water bottle and you need to know where your charcoal is lined up. Because if you turn the lights back on and off, it just takes your night vision away. You also don't stare into the, the pot of this fire and that's all the time. You always look past it. That's a... Why? I just can't finish the story without having to jump to something else. The masters that put the Tatara together, the people that make the Tamagane in Japan, they all go blind. They're, they give their sight to their art. When they make these giant furnaces, they put these observation ports at the bottom, they clear it out and they look in and they're looking for whatever. I, I have no clue but they're looking for it and they know exactly what it is and they know how to see it in a fraction of a second. But sadly, those fractions of a second build up for so long that those intense light, that energy, just takes their vision. And they enter into that fully knowing that will happen. That is what happens to the master. Steel, they must have a better term and I don't know what it is, but hats down, that's, that's a dedication. So by no means am I gonna tell them not to look there. They know exactly what they're doing. I'm just saying to everybody else, be wise. If you're looking there for long periods of times, your eyes are gonna hurt. Well, oh, this has gotta be up to temperature. I'm getting back to work. I hope you build a wonderful forge. Okay, one more topic change. I wanna thank the next new members of the Shinobi, Devin Belden. Seth Baxter and Nintai Kyori. Nintai Shin Kyori. Sorry, that was rude. Ninja Clan level, first member, GWYN, and the first member of Mingatsu Dojo, Queen. Awesome. Thank you to everybody. Your names are going on the board, like momentarily. I'm not talking momentarily. I'm also doing it now. Okay, bye. This wall is looking awesome. Thank you to everyone. Um, yeah, I'm getting back to work.